The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. COVID-19 costs everyone a lot. A new report says COVID misinformation added terribly to those costs. We'll find out more tonight. Also, our Ontario Hubs report on the findings of the citizen-led Ottawa People's Commission into the convoy's effect on city residents. And from bail reform to remembering former Ontario Lieutenant Governor David Onley, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, February 3rd, and that's all ahead on the Agenda. One of the core public health efforts throughout the COVID-19 pandemic was, and still is, communicating with Canadians about how to stay safe and healthy. But as a new report suggests, misinformation from a variety of sources also influenced people at great public and personal cost. With us now on their findings, two of the authors of that report. In Victoria, British Columbia, Jagras Hodson, Canada Research Chair in Digital Communication for the Public Interest at Royal Roads University. And here in Ontario's capital city, former clerk of the Privy Council, Alex Himmelfarb, who is the chair of the Council of Canadian Academies Expert Panel on the Socioeconomic Impacts of Science and Health Misinformation. Welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us on the line. Uh, before we get into our discussions, Let's get some of the major findings from your report. So between March and November 2021, misinformation led to about 2.4 million Canadians avoiding or declining vaccinations. They believe the pandemic to be exaggerated or even a hoax and or that the harmful effects of vaccines had been covered up. You report this led to 2,800 deaths, 13,000 hospitalizations, including 3,500 ICU admissions, and that it cost hospitals a staggering $300 million, the average COVID-19 hospitalization costing more than $13,000. You add that the pandemic misinformation likely contributed to 198,000 COVID cases during this nine months. Finally, you say that these estimates are very conservative. They don't account for lost wages, additional doctor fees, outpatient treatment or long COVID treatment. All right, Jagras, I'm going to start with you. Give us some real examples of the misinformation you were looking at. Oh, thank you. It's a great question. And, you know, there's so much of it out there. But, you know, of course, you know, we've all heard this idea that vaccines maybe could alter your DNA or, you know, that it contains a, a microchip or something. Um, there's the idea that um, you know, all you need maybe is vitamin D or sunlight uh, to fight COVID-19. Uh, really, you, you, you look for messages that are sort of simple, you know, emotional, uh, repeatable, always offering a simple answer to this complex problem um, of public health. And there, of course, are examples in the report that are um, outside of the COVID-19 pandemic as well. Uh, now, I should uh, clarify, when we talk about misinformation, we're talking about false information that is, of course, being inadvertently shared. Um, you, you talk about sort of the messaging behind there and some of the telltale signs of there. Tell us a little bit about sort of the implications and sort of uh, the involvement of social media companies as well, because there is a little bit of play in there as well. Oh, of course, right? So the social media companies, they uh, their mandate really is to make money off of content, um, as in any media company or, or, or many media companies. Um, and so that means that they're going to prioritize content in your feed that is really engaging. And what tends to be engaging, again, is repetition, it is emotional, and it is, um, you know, sometimes it's cute and cuddly, sometimes it's fearful. But it is not necessarily truthful because complexity is often lost when those engagement algorithms prioritize things that we like to click on. So, you know, while social media companies, I don't think, want necessarily to spread misinformation, it, it happens as a side effect of the fact that um, engagement uh, uses a lot of the same tactics as, as the misinformation spreaders do. And just to be clear, Jagras, you were specifically looking at vaccine misinformation. We're not looking at lockdowns or masking necessarily in your report. Yeah, thank you. And important to note that the report isn't just about uh, vaccine misinformation, though we did use that as a case study to demonstrate um, the, one of the costs of misinformation. But yes, we, we didn't look at, at lockdowns, so we looked specifically for that case study and misinformation relative to vaccines, because that created something that we could more easily measure. All right, Alex, take us through this briefly. 
How does that vaccine misinformation then translate into a $300 million strain on Canadian hospitals? Yeah, yeah. Um, just be before you, you, or before I answer that question, let me reiterate what, what Jade was said, and that is this report is not just about vaccine misinformation. It's about misinformation around science and health much more generally, and it has many other examples. But having said that, um, how does how does uh, misinformation translate into costs to health, costs uh, in the form of, of avoidable diseases, even avoidable death and system costs? First of all, let me say that misinformation is not the only reason that um, people avoid vaccines, but it, the research shows it's a major reason. And what the model shows is that had people who believed that uh, that COVID is a hoax and therefore didn't take vaccines, or those people who believed that somehow the costs of vaccines, the dangers and risks of vaccines were much greater than had been let on and hidden, if those people had uh, vaccinated as soon as they were eligible, many fewer would have gotten ill. They would have gotten far less ill had they gotten ill. They would have been far less likely to be admitted to ICU units. They would have created far less uh, pressure on the health system and on health providers who had to deal with extraordinary pressures during that period. And they would have uh, been far less likely to die. The, uh, the key to a democratic society is to have the information to make informed decisions individually and collectively as a society. Misinformation undermines that right, that right to have the information we need to make informed decisions. So we end up making decisions based on, on falsehoods. All right. And as profound consequences, not only for our individual health, but for our collective health. Jagras, I'm gonna to come to you on that point. During the pandemic, the public also received some, some would say some faulty information from governments as well. For example, public health officials said COVID wasn't really airborne or that people who were vaccinated wouldn't be infected and spread the virus. Both of these assertions were of course proven to be false. Did governments sometimes inadvertently spread COVID misinformation? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question, and and one that I that I have heard, you know, on many different you know panels and interviews that that I've been asked to speak at. And um, you know, the the longer answer is, of course, science is always changing and building on itself in in a novel pandemic, for example. And um, well, we don't touch on this necessarily specifically in the report. I, I think it's important to note that public health officials were doing the best they could with the information that they had. But as that information changed, it was often hard um, then to communicate those changes to the public in a way that didn't seem like public health was waffling back and forth. And so, yeah, could they have done things differently in their communication? Um, likely, yes, and, I, and I'm sure many people in public health would tell you the same thing. But it is also complicated by the fact that um, there needs to be, or there's a, there's a limited maybe literacy being demonstrated in just how science is supposed to sometimes contradict itself, especially in a situation where we have very little knowledge. Uh, you know, so so again, you know, I don't want to blame public health, and I believe they were doing the best they could, but but yeah, there were some unintended consequences there, and and inadvertently things didn't always go maybe as well as they could have. Very good, Alex. I'm going to come to you in terms of how this report came to be. You are a former head of the federal public service. Your report was also funded by the federal government. Did the government uh, have any hand at all in how the data was collected or how the report was written? No, not, not at all. The, the government provides funding to the uh, Canadian Council of Academies, but not for this particular study, but just generally core funding for so that the academy is able to do a number of studies over the course of a year. They do put the questions to us, and the question was, what are the socioeconomic consequences of misinformation? 
but they had absolutely no role, no play, no influence, no say in any part of the report. I wonder if I couldn't also just jump on something that Jager said. I agree with everything Jager said on, on your last question, and, she, and her answer was, was exactly right. And the, the science is self-correcting uh, as, as science evolves. No, no one study is definitive as, study, as science evolves, as sci studies are replicated, as our knowledge improves, our certainty increases. But absolute certainty is not generally available. And the difficulty in a crisis is that people often want certainty, and they often want somebody to blame as well, which is why it's a time that's ripe for misinformation and conspiracy theories. Because of that, I do believe that government, public agencies, universities, media all have to get better at communicating scientific information. We do have to get better. We have to be honest about the level of certainty. We have to be honest about how knowledge evolves. We have to engage the community. And also, you know, I, I, I know perfectly well I'm not the right messenger for loads of communities. Uh, government agencies are not the right messenger for loads of communities. So you have to find not only the right message that's accessible and honest, uh, transparent, but you also have to find the right messenger. Uh, and that means not just communication during a crisis, but communication in advance of the crisis, working with communities, building trust, building understanding, and making good information accessible and understandable and honest. Yeah, Chris, I'm going to come to you about uh, the simulation model. You guys use an agent-based simulation model in layman terms. How do you break that down? How does that get the the sort of the data and the findings that uh, we ended up on? Oh, thank you. Yeah, so we used real life data uh, to estimate the economic and human cost of misinformation during a period of COVID-19. So you now estimating, um, you know, for example, um, you know, if the people who had not gotten vaccinated um, had maybe gotten vaccinated um, because they were not exposed to misinformation, then how would things be different? Um, but of course, the tool goes much deeper than that. Alex touched on this and in ways that are less measurable as well, right? So there is not just death, right? There is the sickness and um, you know, length of hospital stays and, and those sorts of things. And the model is actually given very conservative estimates for just eight months of mm -hmm. the COVID-19 pandemic. So the human and economic costs are much higher. The burden given by the states are much higher, um, those faced by vulnerable people. And there were so many things that we couldn't capture, but we wanted to be very mm, precise in what we could capture and not make claims that we couldn't. And that's why the model actually, if anything, errs on the conservative side. Um, and Alex has worked actually much more closely with the model than I can. So I'm going to get him to, uh, to fill us in uh, with a little bit more detail there as well. Alex. You now, Jay Chris did a really good job. The, the, she's right that the, the starting point was real life data. How many people were actually, during this eight month period, who were actually vaccinated? How many people got ill? How many people got admitted? So one, one uh, the starting point was just real life data on what happened in that eight month period. It took into account, by the way, the availability of vaccines and the el eligibility for vaccines so that we made sure that that was not the factor. Uh, we made sure that vaccine, sufficient vaccines were available for everyone who is eligible. It also only looked at people 12 years and over because the eligibility for younger people uh, came later. Okay, that was the starting point. The second point was what if everybody who could have been vaccinated was vaccinated at the point of eligibility? Everybody, regardless of the reasons for which they, they chose not to. And as I said, there are many reasons. It can be individual health reasons, or it could be fear of needles, or it could be just generally people who are a little bit more cautious about uh, medical intervention. So I don't want to suggest that everyone who, who said no to a vaccine was misinformed. But the evidence is <clears throat> persuasive, and we have very concrete evidence about the impact of misinformation on vaccine behavior. And so we took two models based on both that research and survey data. What happens with those for whom, uh, or those who believed that that uh, COVID was a hoax, and so that there was absolutely no need to be vaccinated? And we knew what numbers, that's about 7% of the population, we knew 
what numbers they were, and we knew what impact that had on vaccine behavior. What would have happened had they been vaccinated right away, that is, as soon as eligible? Uh, and what about those who believe that there were nefarious and hidden costs uh, at risks to health, uh, for example, the microchips in, in um, vaccines? And what would have happened had all of them been vaccinated? Those two scenarios. And what we discovered was that that in those two scenarios, there were thousands upon thousands of preventable illnesses, thousands upon thousands of hospital admissions and ICU admissions, and almost three thousand deaths. Uh, you know, not with, and and as as you've mentioned already, and as as the graph showed, hundreds of millions of dollars of costs. That was eight months. That was measured only direct hospital costs, not all costs. But you know, it's it's a model, and I don't want to to dwell on the model. The the evidence is growing and abundant about the cost of misinformation to health, social, and individual, and to to costs. This is just a way of of giving one slice, one narrow slice, to make real and and accessible what we're talking about, because so often it's, it seems abstract. This was simply to bring home a much larger issue. All right, speaking of larger, I wanna take this onto a global stage. Jagras, more than 80% of Canadians have now had two doses of the vaccine. It's one of the highest rates in the world. Many would argue internationally, that's pretty impressive. Uh, and and I'm, I'm wondering, is it in your view that it isn't? <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that at all. Uh, thank you for for asking. I um, uh, nobody is trying to say with this report or otherwise that you know eighty percent of you know people being vaccinated in Canada with two doses is you know somehow coming up short. That wasn't the point of the report. So you know as as Alex said earlier, uh, when we were asked to put together this report, it was about the economic and social costs of misinformation. And so when we turn our attention to vaccine misinformation specifically during COVID-19, that was as a case study to understand the costs of misinformation to public health. And there are other costs as well that they were not as easy to capture. The, what the COVID-19 pandemic was, did was give us an opportunity to take like that eight month time frame and say, okay, well, here is one thing that we know was impacted by misinformation and caused a, you know, a public health outcome. So, so that is it. That wasn't meant to be a critique or a commentary on, on levels of vaccination, because you're right. Uh, you know, we have done relatively well in Canada. But despite doing relatively well in Canada, we, may, we might have, indeed, um, maybe gone a little farther were it not for vaccine-related misinformation. But again, bringing us back to keeping in mind that this report is about misinformation much farther beyond uh, the, the pandemic. It is not just about vaccine misinformation, but about the economic cost of misinformation, more generally speaking, as well. All right, Jaggers, I'm going to stick with you. I'm going to pull up some some other data. Uh, Abacus Data, the same research firm you used for your research, revealed during the same time period you were studying that vaccine-hesitant people were on average 42 years old, 59% were women, 66 had post-secondary education, and the majority, which was 35%, said they had voted liberal. What did you make of that? <laughs> Well, um, you know, I have to admit this is the first time that I am hearing those numbers, so this is going to be um, a little bit off the cuff, uh, if you will. Um, but I, I would say that you know, it's important to recognize that all of us can be a victim of, of misinformation, or nobody is immune, and we like to say, to misinformation. We're all at risk, and we all suffer the consequences. And we suffer those consequences in part because um, you know, we get a dopamine rush from, from clicking share on, on things on social media. We suffer the consequences in part because misinformers have really sophisticated techniques to reach us. Um, we, uh, you know, we're all emotionally like feeling animals and, and we sometimes make you know, decisions based more on emotion than fact. Everybody does. And I am sure that I have run into misinformation in my own life that I've inadvertently believed or shared. So you know, I, I think it, it's really important to recognize that there is no one demographic that is immune to misinformation, uh, and there is no you know, one demographic that 
um, you know, is going to be like, oh, well, they're the ones we have to reach now with the evidence, uh, because it, it's a problem that affects us all, really. Alex, how do you think unvaccinated folks should feel when they read your report? But, you know, let, let, let me again reiterate what Jager said. I, I, thought, uh, I thought, again, Jager gave a great answer to the um, advocates' data that we, that we haven't had a chance to, to review. Our report does suggest that, that uh, people closer to my age than to Jager's age are more likely to consume and, and share misinformation. So our data was slightly different, but, but Jager is right. In this environment, you know, Canadians are really connected. We get more and more of our information from so from social media and from messaging apps. Something like ninety percent of Canadians during the pandemic use social media and messaging apps. Um, Forty percent of, of Canadians said that they'd encountered misinformation that they would actually believed before they changed their minds. None of us is vulnerable, and I would even add that some populations, uh, people of some populations who have earned their distrust of government, indigenous population, racialized population, those who just don't trust the messengers for often very good reason mm -hmm. are going to be hesitant regardless of age and regard. And, and, and so how do I want them to feel? I, I really want them to pause, to think about the information they use, to open themselves up to the to possibility that uh, they, they, you know, one of the things about misinformation is that it's sticky that it's easier to, to provide new information to somebody who thinks they're uninformed than to somebody who is informed but with misinformation. So misinformation is an obstacle to, to learning, to, to incorporating new information. And what we really hope is that people pause, pause, ask this, what source? Is that source trust, trustworthy? Are there other sources? Am I throwing out information willy-nilly just because I don't trust government or I don't trust public institutions. Will I do a little bit more research? I'm not, I, you know, this isn't kind of a moment where suddenly people are going to change their mind because of this report. But what we need to do is work with communities to make sure that we understand their concerns and you know, misinformation is just part of the problem, and to start to, to invest in not only science, because we have to invest more in science, but science communication, mm -hmm. so that we are rebuilding trust between the science institutions and the communities that they serve. I don't want to judge the, the people who uh, mm -hmm. didn't vaccinate. I really ask them, pause think about the information you're using and be open to see whether there are uh, institution, institutions and other sources of information that you might find important, useful. Jagger, so we have about a minute left to get the last question of a pretty big one here. I uh, want to talk solutions here. What do you recommend to combat vaccine misinformation when the next pandemic hits, when we know that sometimes attempts to address misinformation can be seen as some form of censorship. Yeah, thank you. And I, I don't think censorship is the answer. And I, and I know the, the panel doesn't think censorship is the answer either. And I'm just going to go back to many things that, that Alex said. So first of all, recognizing that some communities have very good reasons you know, to not trust government and public health. Secondly, you know, uh, we started the interview today by talking a little bit about, you know, how public health communication maybe um, might have not have been as transparent as it could have been at the early stages of the pandemic. So, you know, uh, admitting the, the, what we know and what we don't know, right? And, and, you know, admitting that the science has changed and the limitations of our approaches, I think, is, is a really good way to help rebuild that trust. And importantly, um, what Alex most recently said about embedding people in communities, going to communities. We are not necessarily, you know, the right messenger for every community. So finding people who are already in community who can tell us what the community needs and what their concerns are and so we can work with communities instead of just talking at people, I think is, is one of the ways that we will make a difference as we move forward, whether it's misinformation during a pandemic or misinformation during another crisis, which could be an issue in the future. Jagras, Alex, thank you so much for your input and thank you so much for joining us on the program tonight. Thank you for having us. Thank you.
While the Emergencies Act final report on the Ottawa convoy won't be released until later this month, a citizen-led inquiry has already released its findings about last year's convoy. Its focus was more on the daily lives of those who live in Ottawa. Sarah Trick is our Ontario Hub's editor. She joins us now from the nation's capital on what they found. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Jen. All right, so let's start off with who are the Ottawa People's Commission? The Ottawa People's Commission is um, an effort of, led by a grassroots activist to try to bring light to the experiences specifically of residents in downtown neighborhoods in Ottawa. Um, it's run through the Centertown Community Health Center um, and its commissioners are active in the human rights field and fairly notable therein. Uh, they did some public hearings um, over the course of 2022 and on Monday they released the first part of their report. This would be a second part in the spring. All right, Sarah, so why did they feel that this commission was needed? Because we know that there are a number of other investigations going into the convoy as well. And they felt that th this investigation was needed because those investigations had very limited scope for citizens of Ottawa to actually talk about um, their own experiences. There was um, limited opportunities in those hearings and those that, that's not their mandate. For, for example, the um, Public Order Emergency Commission had a mandate to determine whether or not the use of the Federal Emergencies Act was justified. That is an important question but it's not going to bring the citizens' experiences to the forefront. So they really felt that they needed to have a venue where citizens could be heard and talk about how this affected them and for those viewpoints to be respected. Now, this report also included voices uh, of those who were against the convoy, but also included those who supported the, the convoy. Uh, why was it important to have those two voices? Well, their mandate was to um, hear from citizens of downtown Ottawa, and citizens of downtown Ottawa have varying perspectives. Um, there were specific days, specific hearings devoted to people who joined the convoy or supported the convoy, and supporters also did come in on other days. Um, one of the reasons why they wanted to make that space was because they felt that um, having the right to protest in a democracy needs to be respected like it is a human right. And they do not wish to um, take a position about whether or not mandates, COVID mandates were needed. It was all about um, people's experiences of the protests and what happened. So therefore it was um, nonpartisan on this question and others. All right, so in terms of key findings, um, it was pretty obvious that a lot of it was sort of negative in, in sort of the response time. There were a couple of city councillors that were praised, but let walk us through some of the key findings from the report itself. The um, key findings from the report were pretty much that um, most residents felt totally abandoned by the city and by its institutions, um, namely the police forces that were operating in the city at the time. Um, one thing that came up a lot in the report was um, sources from the city would often say, you know, avoid downtown, avoid downtown. But the people who were testifying for the report couldn't avoid downtown. They lived there and worked there. Um, essential services such as paratransport did not run in what was called the red zone at the time. Um, people had problems getting to medical care, problems getting to appointments, problems getting food, problems getting medication. Uh, I personally am disabled and I had to um, get somebody to go to a pharmacy once and they basically could not get into the pharmacy to pick up my medication, which I needed, without a police escort. They, they literally had to grab a, um, a couple of police people and ask them to make way for them because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to. Um, and it didn't seem like the city or the police were doing anything about it. Um, one person's testimony said it seemed like the, the official strategy was to just welcome the convoy into downtown and then abandon downtown. Um, there was no clear communication from the city and no help. Um, there was community, community mobilization, but not. Um, so much from official institutions. 
All right, you reached out to Ottawa Police and the City of Ottawa for comment in response to this report. What did they have to say? Well, the Ottawa Police Service declined to comment for the story. Um, the City of Ottawa thanked the OPC for doing this report, um, said that it has worked with the OPS and with other stakeholders. Um, it had worked with them during the convoy and we're going to work with them in the future. And um, that it would take recommendations from this commission and from the Public Order Emergency Commission um, and from any other efforts that might come about. Now, there are plans, as we mentioned off the top, uh, there are plans in the works for more official, a more official investigation into the disruption in Ottawa. Uh, what can we expect from that? Um, there's going to be an audit done by the city's auditor about the conduct of the city of Ottawa and a separate audit done about the conduct of the um, Ottawa Police Services. Um, we're also expecting the report of the Public Order Emergency Commission, whose mandate was to look into whether or not the use of the Emergencies Act, the Federal Emergencies Act, was justified. So um, we're waiting on those findings. And you had mentioned uh, earlier that uh, we can expect a second part of this report at the end of March uh, in regards to solutions. Um, is there any early signs as to what the Ottawa People's Commission is proposing on that front? Yes, yeah, so that report will be released on March 23rd. And again, I think it comes back to um, how to safeguard everybody's human rights um, so that protests can continue um, and the right to assembly in a democracy is respected. But also, so are the rights of vulnerable people, people who live and work in the city, people who um, are affected by these protests. So I think that's what they're going to focus on. Thank you for this, Sarah, and thanks for joining us on the program tonight. Thank you. The agenda this week assessed how to address violence on Toronto Transit, explored the legacy of former Ontario Lieutenant Governor David Onley, asked what the new NDP leader needs to do to prepare for the next provincial election, and learned what rural municipalities are doing to support older adults. The agenda's week in review begins debating the need for bail reform. How typical is it for somebody out on bail to go out and commit a violent offense while out on bail? That's a great question. And I'm not aware of any comprehensive data um, that would indicate how common this kind of uh, situation is. I can tell you the data that I am aware of. In Ontario, on any given night, more than 70% of people in our provincial jails are legally innocent. They're there on remand. They're either waiting for a determination of their bail or they've been denied bail and are waiting for a trial. And it didn't always used to be this way. Um, 20 years ago, the majority of people in provincial and territorial jails had been found guilty and sentenced to an offense and they were serving a sentence for something that they were found to have done. Uh, so when we talk about our overcrowded jails and our bloated justice system that is slow moving, uh, where people charged with relatively minor offenses are spending a lot of time in custody, part of that and a big driver of that is the increase in remand detention. And I think it's really important to, to think about the vast majority of the people who are who are in this situation, and we've heard this, um, you know, this morning, which I think is really important. The vast majority of people are not being detained for, ex and are not in jail, and have been charged with exceptionally serious violent offenses. Um, we see a pattern of people being released on bail and then rearrested for breaching their bail conditions. That underlying conduct might not itself be criminal. So, for instance, if you are released with a curfew and you breach that curfew, you can be brought back into jail, um, you can be rearrested and charged with a new criminal offense for being out on the street at 11 p.m. Um, and I think it's really worth thinking about what the data tells us, because the criminologists would tell us that our bail system in Canada has not become more lenient over time. In fact, it's become more restrictive and more risk averse, leading to more people spending time in jail while they're legally innocent and before they've been convicted of anything. Okay, Chief McSween, uh, maybe I can get you to weigh in on this. Do you have 
either hard data or do you have sufficient anecdotal evidence based on your experience as to how often people who are out on bail uh, com commit violent offenses while on bail? Well, let me, uh, let me just give you this statistic that uh, specific here to York Region, not across the province, and there's a lot of work being done right now to compile these statistics provincially. But in uh, 2021 in York Region, we as an organization seized 121 violent crime handguns, okay? Uh, as a result, 31 of the offenders who we charged with uh, offenses related to those guns were out on a court order of some sort. So that's a quarter of the people um, who were responsible for the crimes related to those guns were reoffending again, once again, in relation to the gun charge already being on, on either bail or another type of court order. So it, it goes to show you that um, people are not abiding by their conditions. And the reality is what we're seeing across the province is more and more people who are charged and uh, with a violent crime and are released on bail are back before the courts again, breaching their bail and again and again. And um, the problem with that is the types of offenses they're responsible for or alleged to have been committed um, are violent crimes. We are not talking about the majority of people. We're talking about that one section of people who are not adhering to their bail conditions are essentially kicking sand in the face of the justice system and knowing that in all likelihood they're going to get released again. And just so I'm clear, Chief, it would be your view, I presume, that that, that quarter of offenders who were originally charged with uh, the possession of guns related to violent circumstances, they should not have been out on bail. Is that your position? Well, I guess the point I'm trying to make uh, is that when they were charged with the crime gun offense, they were on a release already. And that's the point. The point is they were not abiding by the conditions and here they are again back before the courts on a charge related to a firearm. Um, that's unacceptable and that poses a significant risk to the community. And gotcha. um, yeah. Okay, let me, get, let me get Teresa on that and then I wanna hear from Laura as well. You heard the chief's concern. Is that a legitimate concern in your view? Well, I think where the chief and I can agree is that the current system isn't working. The criminal justice system isn't effective in um, preventing reoffenders. And the issue is that the criminal justice system doesn't get to the root of the issue. Uh, I think if we want to deter violence, we have to address the root of the issue of violence. And violence is often born from inequality in our communities. I think really to get to the root of the problem, we really need to be addressing um, the social and public health concern that is born from violence. So we need to be investing in mental health and addiction services. We need to be investing in guaranteed livable income. We need to be investing in safe housing, public washrooms, and all of these social services that keep our communities safe and healthy. Lex, when speaking with transit riders, uh, you've done a, a number of sort of conversations, exposés on, on the start of that. Um, do they want to see more security and, and police? I think it's hard to, to have one response. I mean, we have more than one million people mm -hmm. who take the TTC every day. So there are many different people who feel different ways. Um, I think there are certainly people who, who feel like they would feel more safe with more police on the system. But at the same time, we know that Toronto Police's own data shows that racialized Torontonians are more likely to have worse outcomes with police. So, you know, for example, black and indigenous riders in particular maybe are not feeling as safe with police or they may feel less safe having police there. I think most riders I've spoken to say that there, there needs to be more of a coordinated approach here, considering some of the root causes that might be driving this violence, rather than just policing away a problem that can't be policed away. All right, Diane, I'm gonna to come to you. We're gonna pick up on a couple of thoughts uh, that Lex had mentioned. But uh, over the weekend, there were still more reports of attacks, despite this announcement last week that, you know, we are gonna bring in more police. Do we know if more security and more police will keep workers and passengers safe? That is not evidence-based at all. Um, and I think, you know, at the heart of it, what we're suggesting, uh, because the narrative is very much about people experiencing crisis, and I appreciate that others are pointing out that that is not exclusively the case, uh, but we're saying that if people are in mental health crisis, the answer is to police them. 
That is suggesting that if you are in crisis, you are a criminal. Mm -hmm. I think that's an extremely problematic response. And even if we have people like myself, a crisis worker, uh, who are going into these spaces, where are we going to take people? If they're unhoused, they have nowhere to go. If they are experiencing crisis, we don't have enough community-based mental health supports to actually provide people uh, with the kind of support that they need. So I don't see that this is effective uh, in any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and in fact, again, I think it makes people feel very unsafe in a lot of cases, uh, especially if they're marginalized, and particularly for my folks who are unhoused, who are over-policed, they don't feel safe. All right, uh, I'm going to go read uh, another Toronto Star article. Uh, this is uh, from the perspective of Matt Elliott, uh, who wrote an opinion piece earlier this week in the Toronto Star. Rewind a decade ago, and riding the system used to be more routine interactions with TTC workers. You'd board streetcars by the front door and pay at a fare box next to the operator. Entering a station generally meant going past a booth with a real life person selling tokens. There were at least two employees on every subway train, a driver and of course a guard who would be responsible for making sure platforms were clear and doors were safely closed. These days, all of that has changed. John, it feels like there are less workers on the system. Is this a factor when we're talking about safety and security? Absolutely a factor. As we sit here today, the TTC is positioning itself to remove the guard's position on subway trains. We're going from a two-person operation to a one-person operation. I think it's unconscionable to think that the safety of our riders is paramount when you're removing 50% of your resources from that vehicle. It's a 500-foot train that's moving in rush hour with 2,000 people on board and we're cutting back. How is the operator of that train supposed to safely maneuver that train through tunnels, through stations, but see 500 feet behind them and ensure the safety of their passengers? Um, you know, we're seeing the cuts, we're seeing technology take over. You cannot take the human element out of the service we provide and the frontline service and the visibility. And so I think that the TTC needs to rethink their position when it comes to cutting jobs. I think they need more visibility and more customer service. This is a, uh, no doubt going to be a hard question to answer, but, but what was the one moment in the funeral, above all others, that stood out for you? I would say the bagpipes. The bagpipes playing, it signified in many ways uh, the end, in some ways. Uh, but in other ways, it, it really strengthened me uh, because I realized there's so much that has to be done up ahead. And uh, in that split second, my spirit, my heart just felt pain. But then, you know, my spirit, heart then felt strength that we as Canadians have so much to do up ahead uh, to tackle this large and looming reality. And, and that is that there are so many Canadians right now who are struggling, who are hurting, and they need to know that they're not alone. And um, it is just something that I take great honor moving forward to, to champion. Whose tie is that? That is dad's tie. And uh, it was the only tie that I thought was suitable for today to wear, to honor him and uh, to remember him as well. Great choice. Thank you. Well, we have uh, three others here who knew him well, and we'd like to get some feedback from all of you on what you think, we're going to have this conversation about what we still need to do. Because Michael called me a week ago and challenged us to have this conversation on TVO, so we're going to do that. Uh, but before, we need to get a better sense, and Christine, why don't you start us off here. David Onley's legacy to the province of Ontario, what is it? It's a, it's a great legacy. He's a wonderful, kind man, but he really was a true champion for people with disabilities, and he uh, didn't um, hold back from saying so. And he listened to everyone. He always had time for everyone. And uh, he learned from that, and he went and spoke publicly about it. I think that is a true leader, and that's what I will always remember him for. Lauren, how about you? His legacy in your view. Well, I think the most important thing that I realized is that I so value my relationship with David that became stronger during COVID. Because, of course, we weren't able to gather and, and meet like we normally would. And upon his passing and then in talking with friends within the disability community at the, the, uh, the church on Monday, 
I realized that the, the deep relationship I felt, the mentorship, the sponsorship, the encouragement that I received from David, I wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. That he made every single person feel just as special, just as empowered, just as um, feeling strong that they can do more as well. Where he found the time, I'll never know, but he was so generous with his time. It would be a text here, an email there, um, just to encourage us to join him in making an accessible country. Yeah. See ya. You know, I think um, I got to know David through Twitter. Uh, I was noticing one of the problems um, with the legislation was that um, we had just recently passed the employment accessibility standard, which talked about make changing hiring practices, but we didn't hadn't changed anything for the built environment. So I tagged him in a tweet saying, what did they have to do to Queen's Park for him to become Lieutenant Governor? And um, he replied. <laughs> and at the time, he was the uh, uh, accessibility special advisor to the government and invited me in. So this was after he was LG? Uh, after he was LG, mm -hmm. um, and we both lamented that. <laughs> if only we had met sooner uh, or started talking sooner. Um, but you know, he said it was so, so exciting to talk to me, as, as exciting as it was for me to talk to him, because I had a lot of the missing pieces of the puzzle about what was going wrong in the built environment. And I think what I loved best about him was his ability to be likable, even though he could be incredibly pointed in criticism. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that Merritt is in a good position to do is to not say this literally out loud, but I raised it with her just to sort of make the point. I'm mad as hell too, but I understand why you feel aggrieved. I understand how you feel cheated. I understand that you need a lot more sincerity and action on the part of the governments you elect. I think that's really going to be the turning point for the election in my mind. Unless, you know, we all of a sudden start smiling again and everybody's happy by 2026. I think this is going to be a very unhappy electorate that all the leaders are going to have to face. Kim, I remember David Crombie saying on this program, anger is not a good governing principle. Can you, can you really gin people up and keep them angry for three and a half years till next time? It's harder to do for that three years. But what I'm actually looking for is swagger. You know, I looked at that last election campaign and neither Stephen Del Duca nor Andrea Horvath came at the electorate with swagger. In the 2018 campaign, Andrea was full of swagger. She was ready to govern. She was ready to lead. She had the confidence to do it. She was in first place she in the polls in, for a while. And up until she showcased or she refused at that point to showcase what her front bench looked like. So what Marit needs to do is have the poise and confidence that she's going to do this, have that human connection point, showcase this amazing team that she is assembling that has uh, leaders that have been in the house that people have trusted, the st stakeholders and the public have trusted, and that can show what is her life as a premier going to be? What is she going to do to make your life better? And you also have to consider that with 29 to 36% voter turnout, people want a reason to get off their couches and come and show up to vote that it's going to be different. 20, 29 to 36? Depen depending on the writing. <laughs> Certainly oh, some God. writings were terrible. Because I think province-wide it was what last time? 40-something? 40 40? It was just, on, it was around 40, but in some writings you saw, you saw numbers that were 29 percent in our last municipal campaigns across the province they were definitely in that low 20s hot you know mid to mid 30s people need a reason to get up and i'll tell you the more that uh, leaders can showcase their personality their authenticity and have a bit of hope for people with that genuine swagger that's how you bring more people all right carl tell me this you, you've worked for four different new democrat leaders over the years and one of the most precious commodities those leaders have in between elections is time. They have to manage their time brilliantly, frankly. What would you tell Marit Stiles about what she needs to do with her time over the next three and a half years? How should she spend it? Well, she should expose herself to the electorate. She needs to be known. She's all known right now. Uh, in as much as she was a, you know, a, a successful uh, culture of tea and uh, you know very well uh, uh, spoken uh, uh, opposition MPP. Most of parents don't know who she is. She's a nominal entity. So her mission right now is to frame our political persona for the Ontario. 
And and it's something that you cannot do if you just stay at Queen's Park. You need to get on the road, to be on the road, to be in a community. And not just the community where New Democrats have succeeded or could succeed. You need to go elsewhere. You need to be seen and heard everywhere. Michelle, can I get you on that? Three and a half years, how should she spend her time? You used to do communications for <laughs> Andrea Horvath. What would you learn from that that you would apply to next time? So I actually tend to agree with Carl. I think spending time out in communities in all parts of the province is a very important thing for Mart to be doing right now. And I would point out that she actually is doing that work since she launched, la formally launched her, her leadership bid. Um, you know, by my count, scouring her social media, she's been to at least 18 places. And we're talking about regions where we hold seats from Ottawa to Waterloo. We're talking about regions where we lost ridings in the last election, like Timmins. Um, and we're also talking about regions where we don't have a presence, places like Barrie. So I think that's really important work for Mart to Would be doing. Would you advise her to go to Barrie, a seat the NDP is <laughs> Number one, would you would you say that's a, a good use of time? Look, you know, we're we're talking about growing and strengthening and expanding support for the party. So I do think you know you're going to be looking at places like the 905. I think you want to expand in places of strength like Northern Ontario and Southwestern Ontario. Absolutely. You and know, uh, I should just put this to you, Sarah. I mean, Andrea Horvath made a lot of visits to Brampton over the previous four years didn't help you hold your seat. Ultimately, it did not. So is it still worth it to put that, to, la to labor in those vineyards that so often don't pay off for you? Well, I, I think it's important to show up. And I think for community, that matters. Um, you know, when we look at Andrea being in Brampton time and time again, it did matter. Um, you know, unfortunately, the results were what they were. But helped you the first time, it, it, just it not the second It absolutely helped the first time. And I think there were many factors at play the second time around that resulted in, in the outcomes that we had. But I think it matters to community. To Michelle's point, I think showing up in places like Barrie or Newmarket, where we may not have had a seat, or maybe it seems um, unlikely that we would win there. I think for the base and, and new Democrats and progressives in those communities, it does matter that the leader is showing up. Any idea what percentage of your population are seniors? Yes. So we have a very skewed percentage of that population. So 55% of our uh, residents are 55 years and older. And the average for the province is 33%. So you can tell we are really skewed towards having far more seniors than the rest of the province. You are a little disproportionately older than the rest of the province. Yes. Okay. Is that good? Is that bad? Is that well, um, what is that? It's good in the sense that we have a lot of residents with wide ranges of experiences, so they can share their experiences with us. It's not so good when you think about a vulnerable population. And, you know, some seniors are fine on their own, but some seniors, just like the rest of the age groups, need more help. So it can be a problem for us to make sure our residents are able to stay where they want to stay in our community. Gotcha. How about Simcoe County? Any idea what percentage is senior? Absolutely. We're 19.9 percent, 65 plus. So we're above the provincial and the national average. Um, and again, a great history, great culture, but lots of challenges for our senior population because much of the communities are small, uh, rural, and really spread apart across the entire region. So it presents some challenges for our aging population. Why do seniors like to live there in disproportionate numbers? if there are so many challenges with regards to access to services and appropriate housing and all of that. I think that's part of our great, uh, a very rich history in the county of Simcoe. Um, we have a lot of uh, farmland, a lot of farmers, um, and small municipalities that have been here for, you know, over 100, 150, 200 years. And so they're very proud of that, that heritage and their culture um, and proud to live where they are. Uh, and so we're working really hard to ensure that they have all the services and amenities so they can continue to live in their homes uh, within the county. So you have multiple generations of people who came maybe a century and a half ago, and have just stayed. Very much so. Huh. How about in your experience? Um, it's pretty much the same. We have a lot of farmland, a lot of rural areas, but uh, we do have, fortunately, um, amongst some of our seniors, researchers who work with uh, the Rural Ontario Institute, and they've looked at why young people leave. So it's kind of the opposite side of the question. Mm. And I thought it would be 
the lack of employment opportunities, but really it's the lack of the housing that young people want. So not enough apartments, condos, small houses, and also not enough amenities that they want. So not enough opportunities to go out to a bar or to go dancing to a club, or even just you know go to a maker space and make something together. So it's interesting when you talk about why you have a lot of seniors, you also have to look at, well, why is your youth leaving? Mm. Do you, okay, this is going to sound like a really dumb question. Do you have a movie theater in your community? No. Do you have a, like a nightclub or something like that in your community? No. So, okay, these are <laughs> things young people like to do. And yes. there you go. Yeah. Any chance of either of those things happening? Well, we did have a drive-in <laughs> open nearby, oh, which cool. was exciting. Yeah. yeah, the nightclub, I know some of the young people would love to do it, but, you know, they need, I guess, venture capital. They don't have the money to do it. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, February 3rd, 2023. Monday, we'll find out why a recent court decision in Kitchener-Waterloo could have far-reaching implications for homeless encampments and those without adequate housing in this province. I'm Jane Jaganathan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO. Org. Have a great weekend, and Steve, we'll see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.